This is Your Superior Self, Episode 70, The Science Behind Humor, with humor scientist Matt Kazam. Because what I learned from doing morning radio from all those years is why is the drive to work the shittiest part of their day you know i mean that's why they loved us because we we made the pain go away during the worst time you know you know why does work have to suck you know and 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 it didn't they didn't seem this way 30 years ago when i started so i started to kind of do some do some you know analysis on that and and found that uh the the research says that you know people want to work for a funny boss that you know what that right now they don't feel emotionally safe they don't feel valued they don't even know how to connect with their coworkers because they used to be able to connect by telling jokes to each other but now they won't allow them to do that so this this is a way to really help you know corporate culture what is going on superior nation welcome back to your favorite podcast your superior self the podcast that helps get you motivated to move forward in your life and get inspired to achieve that greatness that you've always wanted for yourself. I'm your host, Trey Downs, and I want to start today's episode out with a quote from the book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. And the quote is, becoming a leader is a lot like investing successfully in the stock market. If your hope is to make a fortune in a day, you're not going to be successful. I couldn't agree more with that quote because it's like, as a leader, you have to continuously work at it. Like there is no finish line. You're going to have to get better. There times are changing. Leadership changes with the times and you're going to have to get better. And you're, there's going to be more skills that you're going to have to obtain. And leadership is forever evolving and you have to evolve with that. And to be able to re- recognize that that's like one of the steps of being a leader. You have to be aware of your surroundings and the times that you're in. I'm actually creating a course on leadership for millennial leaders to help them become the leader that no one ever taught us how to be. I feel like we're putting these positions, these these leadership roles out of college, out of the craft, out of the frontline management scene, and we don't have the d- development that we need to succeed as a leader. It's like you kind of imagine what your last boss was or you have this idea of what a leader leader should be and you try to be that. And it's tough sometimes. You don't get the results that you want. And as a millennial, it's tough because, I mean, if you think about it, like our generation, who has been that true leader? You know, everybody always refers to John Wayne being that leader that everybody wants to be like. And it's kind of like that way is not really what we're trying to do nowadays like that that silent strong type is okay for maybe older generations but the newer generation the millennial generation i think we need to be more open to scenarios and situations and we have to keep an open mind and we have to be be present in our decision making and we have to uh, allow failure we have to allow failure in in our employees and that is how they learn uh from those situations and we have to mentor them we have to develop their careers we have to delegate i mean all of those things Uh, I discuss in my course and I'm excited about it because leadership to me is something that I'm very passionate about. I, I, I I love it. I love being the guy that makes the decisions and and people look to for advice and and mentorship. Uh, So I'm, I mean, I am creating that currently and I'm excited to get that out. So if you want to immediately raise your game in the leadership arena, you can text the word superior to 444-999 and sign up for my email list. Or you can head over to yoursuperiorself.com and sign up for my email list over there. And two things will happen. One, every episode that I record will be sent directly to your inbox. And two, I will send you my top 10 tips on leadership. In these 10 tips, you will be able to implement in your daily routine and you will see an increase in your influence amongst your peers or employees immediately. And to help us transform company culture and make punchlines improve bottom lines, I have Matt Kazam on the show today. With over 30 years experience and over 6,500 shows as a stand-up comedian, including over a thousand corporate events, Matt Kazam is the expert on the science of humor. 
whether as a keynote speaker, a corporate trainer, or now online via Matt's virtual training system, the Strategic Humor Institute, Matt has a unique ability to teach the tools of stand-up comedy into an effective program for any profession, from lawyers to doctors, teachers to corporate leaders, activists to actors, everyone can benefit from using humor in the acquiring the skills of a stand-up comedian. I'm excited about my conversation with Matt Kazam, and I know you will too, so make sure you have a notepad because Matt has some great techniques on how to fuse a crowd and get your message to the entire audience. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Matt Kazam. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. Tonight, I am fired up because I have my boy Matt Kazam on the show. He is comedian. He is a comedian and a humor scientist. I've never heard of that before, and I'm loving it. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. Hey, man, my pleasure. It's been a... I think we wanted to do this almost a year ago, and I'm mm-hmm. so glad that we're doing it now because uh, I'm so much further along in in, in the process. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, but it's funny, you know, humor scientists and comedian. You would think, well, humor scientist is just another name for comedian, but mm-hmm. but I, I don't, you know, take that uh, that, that 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 you know definition. Uh, just as like, oh, I want to find a cool way to say comedian in a different way. But I actually spent the last two years becoming a humor scientist and learning, you know, why people laugh. And, you know, if, if I was going to eventually help people use this as a strategy in business and life, you know, it, it, being a comedian doesn't necessarily give me that, uh, you know, qualification to be able to do that. Um, so I actually had to go out and study uh, for the last two years and get my Ph.D. in, in, in humor Um and, and and learning, you know, again, where laughter comes from, you know, well, you know, why is why were we born with it? You know, because I really want to give it back to society because I feel like it was taken from us and it's still being taken from us on a on a daily basis. Uh, but those who take it aren't human scientists, don't understand that it, it has its place in, in society, very important place in society. And one of the two forms of communication we're given at birth. Um, so, uh, yeah, so humor scientist is, is much different than a comedian. And, uh, it, uh, it, it's something that I've worked really hard, uh, recently to, 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 to become and not just, you know, Hey, you know, I want a, a catchy thing that's going to be able to, uh, you know, get, get me speaking gigs. You should start, you should create a hashtag humor scientist. I, I should, you know, and, and it's funny because the people who do this in the space that I'm now kind of creating and, and they, they do it at a low level. It's guys who couldn't get any laughs at a comedy club, but still kind of wanted to, you know, make a few bucks off of this. So they became, you know, humor coaches in the mm-hmm. business world. But, you know, they wouldn't know funny if a pie hit him in the <laughs> face. You know, they, uh, well, and, well, I want to know, like, how do you study that? Like the science of it? Like I, I've. I guess I never really gave it too much thought. I mean, yeah, I know there's a science in communicating, but like be doing stand up, like you yeah. know, figuring out what, how and why people laugh. Like, how did you study that? It's well, you know, there's a lot of research out there by, you know, neuroscientists, you know, people who understand how the brain works and, and they've done all these things. However, these people are not, you know, they wouldn't know how to go out and make somebody laugh, but there is a shitload of data out there um, on, uh, on on humor and, 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 and you know, human behavior and, and where it comes from. And so people have done tons and tons of studies. So when I went out there, I mean, I'm like, if you want to learn about this, just Google it because there's tons of people now. But no one's ever bridged the two worlds with basically coming from, you know, the clinical. But then I'm coming from the theoretical side where, you know, over 6,500 shows – I've been in there doing what I knew intuitively. You know, I mean, I knew how to make people laugh since I came out of the womb being able to make people laugh. Uh, that, that, that part's never been a problem, but I never knew what I was doing and why it was affecting these people so much, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, people like I found out people only laugh for two reasons. They laugh out of superiority and they laugh at a commonality. And now it, that became really, really important because as I'm trying to give this back to uh, the workplace, for example, the reason it was taken from us is for that very reason. You know, that, that we only laugh for two reasons. We laugh at a commonality, which is 
just a bunch of us getting around the water cooler talking about, you know, traffic and parenting and, you know, having the, you know, not having enough time in the day and all the things that kind of bring us together. There's also this part where, you know, if there's a victim in the joke, I always tell people don't tell it. You know, I mean, if you want to know how to avoid the pitfalls of of what, you know, 90 percent of, of, of humor with uses are going to have a positive outcome because it's just, you know. It's based in empathy, and if you do it the right way, like that, that, for example, I didn't know. I didn't know that humor was based in empathy, but I knew that every time I wanted to make somebody laugh, I put them first. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was starting to learn all the things that I knew intuitively were actual real science, you know, there. But there's been a ton of uh, unfunny people who have studied this uh, throughout mm-hmm. the history of time. Um, and I do think it goes back that, that far. I mean, think about the court jester. You know, when I found out, I always thought the court jester, like everyone else, was the king kept the comedian around just to entertain him, you know. And and that wasn't why he kept the comedian around. He kept the comedian around because he wanted to understand the humor of his subjects. Because if you can understand why they're laughing, the same way you can if you understand why they're crying, you'll understand them on a deeper level and, and be able to, you know, uh, you know, I guess keep them in line is what yeah. the king wanted to do. But, you know, this job goes back pretty far. I mean, it was, think about it, it as the first government job, you know, was being a comedian. So, um, so, you know, and then, you know, now what will come in the future will be books, my own books about, you know, after I compiled the science. But, yeah, no, it's 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 all out there. And um, and 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 and. Basically, every it's in every human being that lives, you know, that's alive. You know, it, it, it's in a bunch. Of, it can be nonverbal. It comes in all these different modalities, um, you know. So if you can learn the science of humor, you can effectively communicate or at least engage every human being on Earth, you know, which is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty powerful uh, tool to have, a club to have in your bag for sure. Well, you talk about how we're losing that, right? Like like stand up or or – the humor of storytelling, like who, who is taking this away from us? Uh, political correctness. I mean, the same people that you, that you think, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think it's like anything else in society where people soar it as a problem. So they just throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, you know, you can't tell a joke at work. I have one client here in Las Vegas, the company last year had to fire six people for in essence, telling a, a bad joke, you know, yet they, Tell them to show up and be themselves and, you know, be in the moment and, you know, and and, and be truthful and yet, you know, never gave them any real humor training. So, you know, I think it's 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 the corporations, it's the politicians, it's it's everyone who's saying, you know what, there is some bad outcomes to this um so we're just going to take it away and go you know what you can't use you can't tell any jokes because you know what some of them might be you know offensive to some people but if you think about that's the way it's going to be as an art form you know if i if i have my act and you know i always tell comedians be truthful to 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 the craft you know whatever you think is funny if that's your point of view, go out there and do it, and then you'll fi- you'll either find an audience or you won't. But when we're talking about using it as strategy, and um, it has nothing to do with what I think is funny. It has to, it's, it's more about math, you know. I mean, what do I know about this audience? You know, it's a group of lawyers. You know, I had a guy. I have a couple of high level. Um, uh, uh, coaching clients, and and one is Kevin Harrington. Okay, he invented the infomercial. He's mm-hmm. the original shark mm-hmm. from Shark Tank. And Kevin had to get up, and Kevin wouldn't mind me telling this story. He had to get up in front of a bunch of realtors to do a big talk in front of a bunch of realtors. And and for me, you know, with Kevin, he's sixty. You know, he's he's lived this amazing life, and he has this amazing perspective. So we, and now he's the digital guy, the as seen on TV guy is now the as seen on the computer guy, <laughs> and so so a lot of it is how business is changing and how he had to evolve. I mean, there was a point where people started cutting the cords, and it basically cut his throat. You know, the lifeline of his business being able to sell products that way went away. You know, the infomercial went away, and he had to now sell digitally. And he we we talk about that in in, in his talks. But, you know, we were talking about how that, that business is changing. When you used to need a realtor, all you needed was a guy in a gold jacket to show up. And you probably don't even understand why that's funny. But that was Century 21. It was like yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that was all you wanted, you know, yeah. it was a guy a big, in a gold jacket. A big jacket. check, right? They had the that's big checks. Yeah, they had the big checks. And, and uh, you know, so we wrote all these jokes. But then Kevin was like, well, what if there's some Century 21 realtors in there? They might get offended by this. And I go – I see. I, I think about that in real time now, so I don't always articulate it when I'm when I'm coaching someone. But I go, mm. I've already done the 
20 outcomes that are going to be bad. I've already done those jokes in my head and I've already eliminated those. So, you know, I've thought about this. And yes, I mean, yes, when you're putting together humor and, and using it as strategy, the first thing you wouldn't want to do is piss anybody off. So, um, <laughs> so you know, you, you've got to think about that. But I think if you just think about what am I trying to accomplish here, which is not just get a laugh or even get a cheap laugh, but I want them all laughing. And, and again, to the science point of view, um, I created a concept called crowd fusing. And this is basically – just what I'm trying to do is, you know, when Chris Rock walks on the stage, he has the audience right away. But the reason he has them is, it's, 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 yes, it's because he's famous, but it's because all of the audience members' minds clicked at the same time and said, that was Chris Rock. When you get everybody's mind clicking in one direction, um, you, what happens is they become one being of energy and not just, you know, a thousand individuals, but just one big group of energy that I can now fuse. And, uh, you know, even if you're not famous, because I can get all their minds going in one direction, if I think about them and, you know, and so maybe they're not all realtors or they're not all lawyers, but you know what? The event might be in Baltimore. Maybe I open up with a joke about Baltimore, but again, a positive joke about Baltimore, <laughs> you know, there, there might be one or two, right? There might be one or two. Well, I heard your stand up at, at Joe's, uh, what was it? I think it was his release of his new, of his new book. Um, and you came up there to, you know, you, you, I don't know if it was right around Cadre Con or not, but you got, you did stand up for him. Yeah. Um, and you did a couple jokes about Baltimore and, uh, they were pretty legit. I mean, they were funny. I mean, they were, you know, it's, it's so weird. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I feel like I have expectations of what a stand up is, but you don't yeah. meet those because it's like you use strategy in your jokes. You use strategy to, to fuse the crowd and it works. And I'm not used yeah. to that really. Cause I guess I'm used to the amateur stuff. And like you said, sure. a lot of the guys are going after the cheap jokes, but when you watch your stand up, you watch your, your bits, they're, they're strategic. Like you're going after the, you're creating that fusion and it's pretty yeah. artistic. Yeah. It's like pretty cool to watch. Cause you're like, you can see the room at first. It's kind of like, they don't know what to expect. You know, uh, they've heard of you, they've listened to you and they, they respect, you know, your craft. And then you start working your, your craft here and you start fusing it. You can kind of see the room come together. And then it's like, people are drawing closer to you. And all of a sudden now they're one and now they're just everything you're saying they're hitting off. And I think it's pretty awesome to, yeah. to watch you do that. And again, what I learned early on from, you know, I, I was very, very lucky. So I started comedy in 1989. So this is over 30 years of me doing it. But uh, the comedians we used to go on the road with, I mean, used to spend six days in a condo with Jeff Foxworthy and Ray Romano and Drew Carey. And, and we would spend the whole week and these guys would teach, you know, basically I got a PhD in comedy, um, you know, right after college. My father said, you know what, you got to go to college. So I, 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 majored in finance because he was a finance professor and I knew I could knock that out in three years. And, and basically I was preparing just for, you know, getting the degree and then going out on the road and doing stand up. But I had been doing it since I'm three years old and, you know, various little, you know, neighborhood shows and family shows. Uh, but then, you know, I got that out there on the road and, and I learned from the best. And, and one thing they always told me was you do the jokes you have to do to get the jokes you want to do. And it, 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 it just resonated with me. It made so much sense. Whereas, yes, I'm going to come out there and I'm going to take some shots at Baltimore and Dundalk and everything else. But I'm certainly <laughs> not going to do that until I've earned their trust. Yeah. You know, and, and so if you just whereas most people just go out there and, and they just they just start spitting out jokes or they just start spitting out information when they're speaking. And I'm like, there are so many nonverbal things. That's why I say humor exists on so many different modalities it, that it can be nonverbal. A lot of it is nonverbal, especially, you know, when, when you're walking to the microphone in the first 30 seconds when they're processing you, um, you know, you, you can be using that time to your advantage. So whereas it just kind of looks like I'm just doing stand up, a lot of thought goes behind it, which is now why I can teach you know, other people had to do it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a bunch of different ways, videos, speaking, you know, uh, writing, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, um, you know, I have a program called stand up and sell where I talk about treating the sales opportunity like a performance and, uh, you know, understanding that the audience has a bunch of expectations, uh, when they come into this situation. And one of them is a fear of being sold. But what if you could over the course of that presentation, be strategic about it using humor and storytelling. They say, it takes 20 interactions to gain someone's trust or you can make them laugh once. 
because if you make them laugh, now you're into the subconscious mind. And again, more of the humor scientist nerd stuff that, you know, for me, it just, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, they, they, and this became great because there are so many people that are naturally funny. And I always say, in case of a tie, the funnier person is going to win. And so many people out there have been losing. So many of your listeners, you want to be your superior self? You know, so many have been losing to that naturally funny guy. But I go for everyone else now. There is real science here. Um, uh, and everyone goes, Yo, you can't teach somebody how to be funny. I go, no, you can't teach somebody how to be funny. You know, I've, I've, I've been doing this for, for a very long time and, and understand it uh, because I'm painfully shy in real life. That I have to actually overcome my natural personality to do what I do. Um, so I know that that's not a barrier to this. I, I you know, I, it's just it's and that's been the great joy of this part of my life. You know, when I was three years old, I knew I wanted to be a comedian. When I'm ten years old, my parents take me to Las Vegas. I see my first comedy show, Joan Rivers and Shecky Green at the Riviera. I knew right then that that's what I wanted to do with my life. Thirty five years later, I got my own show in the same room that I saw the show when I was ten years old. Two years later, they blow up the casino. But that's the part of the story you got to block out. <laughs> Otherwise, a beautiful tale about a boy in his dream. But, you know, when, when, when your dream comes true, you know, either you look for another dream or you, you figure out, you know, what's your legacy going to be. And I think that that's where I am now, which is a real, really exciting place to be. You know, I mean, it's another word for saying I'm getting old, but, you know, that's cool. <laughs> I, can, I, I can live with it. Well, there are so many stories, I'm sure, in that 35 years. I mean, you were here in Baltimore with uh, on the radio with um, Kirk, Mark, and Lopez, right? Yeah, the great, greatest radio morning and, show and, in the history of the world. Yeah. And we were talking about how you kept Howard Stern out of the market. like Not me how, specifically, but the show itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, how, I mean, strategically, you have to put that up, right? You have, you have to be able to de defend your territory. Like, what did yeah. you see? What did, I mean, I'm sure you learned a great deal of, um, you know, how to – protect your market right like how do, i mean how the how do those guys do it we i think really understanding the 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 the, the mental makeup of of the bolta of the person from baltimore but it is a specific type of person you know i mean it's not the north it's not the south you know you really got it's really been left for dead as 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 a city i mean it's coming back now uh you know in in in, in some ways but we're talking 20 years ago, you know, Baltimore was like Erie, Pennsylvania. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it, so it's a, I think understanding that person and that blue collar work ethic, um, you know, and then going that, you know what, Howard Stern's fame and, 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 you know, his global approach to broadcasting. It, it, and I think if other towns did that, instead of just kind of doing a generic morning show, we did a morning show for the people of Baltimore and understood that that, for people who had kind of a tough go of it, the morning is the worst part of their day because they're going to a job they can't stand. You know, they're going, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, they're probably in a car that they, you know, it, it, it's, it's in some places they're in a car they can't afford. And these other people, they're in a car that they don't even know if it's going to make it home on time, you know. <laughs> so I think we understood this and we just said, hey, listen, we're going to make them laugh. You know, um, I remember one morning we were at Fells Point uh, doing, uh, uh, I think it was kegs and eggs, or I can't remember what they called it, but it was a, it was a, with, with, we did a lot of live events so that the people could come and hang out with us. But we did the show at like six so that they could, we knew these weren't people who can call in late to work. You know, <laughs> we understood that about them. So, you know, everything we did, we, we, we thought it was, it was again really empathetic. And, and I think that's, that's what society is missing. So when I say as much as, you know, here I am trying to give humanity, humor back to people. I'm also trying to, you know, give empathy back to people because, you know, we're so fractured and, and we've stopped thinking about each other as human beings that, uh, you know, that was why we won there because we, we really understood them and we gave them, you know, not, not what they wanted to hear, but what, you know, what made them feel something every single morning. And, and, mm -hmm. and we went over time. I mean, we could have ended that show every morning at nine o'clock and most mornings we went till 10 just because we wanted to give him a little bit more. And, 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 and I think that was the beauty of that show. And, and Lopez wound up dying, you know, wound up getting cancer and dying. Um, but the, the three of those guys together, 
when I walked in the first time, it was just like, it was like jazz. I mean, it was just like this one continuous thing that happened in the morning. And I just got in there and just started riffing with them. And, and I, and I had done Baltimore for so long. I started at the Charm City Comedy Club, you know, I'm doing this 30 years. So, you know, I, I understood Baltimore really, really well. And, uh, uh, it's, it's unlike a lot of different towns. So I think we were dialed in and, and, and that, 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 that's, if you're gonna, you know, win over an audience or engage them or persuade them you're gonna have to get real dialed in on on who they are and and instead of the egocentric part of us who go you know what i'm just gonna go out there and do what i do and they're gonna like it you know or not but you know that that's not strategy you mm. know? yeah market strategy i mean that knowing your customer knowing your client i mean baltimore is a funny town like people people don't sleep on baltimore like a lot of no. my a lot of my friends blue collar i mean they got great sense of humor i mean like they have me like uh, pissing my pants sometimes. I mean, it is. Oh, I, I yeah. love Baltimore. Baltimore is a, is a great town. It just, it seems like, um, you know, like you were talking about taking the humor out. I think we're getting yeah. too political, politi- politically uh, correct. And, uh, we're, we're and that was sensitive. the other thing too, is that it was that Baltimore when, when political correctness was taking over the country, the radio station, because it was a standalone owned by the Hearst Corporation, uh, Hearst, yeah, um, and they uh, it was up there on you know TV Hill, and they did the the BAL I think was downstairs, but one family I think from Baltimore owned this uh, station where it wasn't owned by Disney, and they owned thousands of stations, and you know these guys said keep doing it you know i mean the fcc would call and go oh my gosh you guys you know you're not allowed to do this and you're not allowed to do that and and. And, you know, they said, keep pushing it because that's how, because they, they would because if Howard Stern came into that market, that radio, that radio station was done. I mean, yeah. you know, I, it was the morning show that made all the money. Uh, so, you know, it, they let us do what we wanted, but that's what Baltimore wanted. I remember that morning I did something called Edward Forty Hands where uh, <laughs> is that is did you start that? No, no, I didn't start it, but somebody said Edward Forty, and so we did a live event, and they strapped two forties to my hands, and I remember my hands freezing, like just that was the most uncomfortable part of it. Drinking eighty ounces of beer wasn't a problem, but uh, <laughs> having my hands taped to these two forties was was, and I wound up drinking three forties, getting drunk as a skunk on the air. But I mean, you want to talk about a city that would embrace that, you know, and think that was hilarious? <laughs> it's Baltimore, so you know, we gave them we gave them what they wanted. We pushed it i remember one morning we did you know those dirty sanchez you know that thing dirty yeah, sanchez yeah, yeah. we did a whole four hours just on every single i mean so many of those horrible things but today you could never do anything like this yeah. um and baltimore i think uh you know humor is important when a town gets beaten down like that so many times and you know it's and and then what what you know what an inner city you know, person connect with somebody from, you know, Cockeysville or Dundalk yeah, County. Humor, yeah. humor, humor is the only thing that can bring them together. So, you know, Baltimore, it, it, it's, 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 it is a very funny town, even though, you know, people don't think about it in that way, but, uh, you know, humor gets you through a lot of bad times, you know, a lot of tough times, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it other people see it as, uh, as the powerful, you know, commodity that it is, whereas other places go, eh, you know what? When I think of of affluent of, of areas like Northern Virginia or, you know, Montgomery County or Ashburn or Loudoun County, you know, humor is not important to those people. No. I mean, you know, not at all. I mean, it's it's not valued. It's not revered. It's not celebrated. But, you know, you go to a corner, you know, over there in Essex or, you know, you go someplace, you know, you walk into one of these delis. The first thing the guy's going to do is try to make you laugh because it's still valued and 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 it, it's the most powerful part of the human experience and 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 we have changed so much you know as as a species you know in terms of attention span and how do you connect because our conscious minds are under full assault. You've got a podcast. Somebody else got a podcast. Somebody else you know between social media, everyone's trying to get at them, but nobody's trying to really connect with them. You know they're just trying to give them more information. So. You know, humor is your gateway into the subconscious, which is where I can make real connections, where every human emotion lives, long term feeling. Um, and that's that's where I like to operate. But if you think you're going to break through any other way, you know, uh, uh, it, it, you're pretty limited in, in this day and age. Now, fame will do that, which is what everybody's chasing, because fame is the great equalizer. But, you know, for everyone else, there's there's still real human ways to make a human connection. 
Mm. Yeah. And I've been thinking about, you know, you know, you're working a lot in the public speaking space and trying to help executives and, and corporate types up their game and get on stages and help, you know, get attention that way. I mean, I'm, I'm dabbling in that myself right now and trying to, um, you know, get on stages myself. And and the best way to connect is through humor. And you're doing that right now. You've, you've created yeah. a course, right? I have a couple, couple of different courses. I mean, you know, it, it, it's the public speaking one is, is, is so natural. You know, I mean, it was the first course I created 15 years ago called stand up and public speak. And it basically just took the tools of stand up comedy and, and applied them to, you know, public speaking, because one of the reasons public speaking is such a huge problem is, is that it's just, they keep taking the same science and making it longer. Like there was a public speaking course the other day. It was 72 hours. There is nothing in public speaking that you need to study for 72 hours, you know? Like, I don't teach people breathing techniques. What I do is teach them that to be so comfortable on stage, they're not going to be breathing heavy. You know, I think there's only – with with, with stand-up, it's pretty streamlined in terms of, you know, what I need to do to be successful. And, you know, there's just too much, you know, of other people's science, you know, out there when it comes to public speaking. So – it, it, it's the one I could have the quickest impact and it was the, the quickest the path to revenue with my business was, you know, basically, you know, releasing this course and speaking on it and, you know, teaching people communication training. But, you know, the, the, the other stuff I'm doing is, you know, I have a course leading with humor and empathy where I'm teaching leaders at companies. Um, Cause what I learned from doing morning radio from all those years is why is the drive to work the shittiest part of their day. You know, I mean, that's why they loved us because we we made the pain go away during the worst time, you know, you know, why does work have to suck, you know? And, and, and it didn't, they didn't seem this way 30 years ago when I started. So I started to kind of do some, do some, you know, analysis on that and, and found that, uh, the, the research says that, you know, people want to work for a funny boss that, you know what, that right now they don't feel emotionally safe. They don't feel valued. They don't even know how to connect with their coworkers because they used to be able to connect by telling jokes to each other. But now they won't allow them to do that. So this this is a way to really help, you know, corporate culture, you know, that that that's another way, you know. So, I, yeah, I, I have the, the courses stand up and public speak, but, you know, I have LOL 101, which basically – is, is our way back to, um, you know, just basically teaching people why, you know, again, why people laugh, you know, and, 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 and letting it be the thing that you, you do first, you know, like, like your first instinct should be to be funny, you know I mean? But it's not because we've shut down that part of our personality. So I've got to kind of do the factory reset, you know, on, on human beings. So I created those courses, um, you know, basically that, so people understand that, you know what? I, I tell them how I've used humor and the science of 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 of, of stand up comedy, you know, uh, to win over my audience to get out of over twenty speeding tickets. I, I I've not got paid a ticket in in the last twenty years because when the cop pulls me over, I know exactly what to do to be empathetic towards his situation because what most people think about is themselves when they get pulled over and not think about that this is the shittiest part of the cop's job is walking up to that car. He has no idea who's in there. More cops get shot by the person they pull over than die in a bank robbery or anywhere else. So, you know, the first thing I do is I I don't escalate the situation. I put my hands on the steering wheel. I roll down the window. I take off my sunglasses, and I'm ready. So I don't reach for the glove box. What do you think he thinks? All you're doing is making a negative situation more negative, you know, trying to put your seatbelt on. And when he asks you, you know why I pulled you over? Don't lie to him. You're going to be the one person that's able to lie your way out of a ticket. Tell him the truth. It freaks him out. He goes, do you know why I pulled you over? I go, yeah, I was really flying, wasn't I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> till I saw you, then I hit the brakes really hard. That must have been fun. <laughs> and next was, thing you know, he's yeah. laughing and I made a real connection with the human being because the office is not going to let me off, but Jim might. And Jim does, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. So that mm-hmm. that's what I – so, yes, I mean, it is public speaking, but – it's really more using humor and strategy. I say it's, you know, to, to win in business and life, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yes, it will make you a better speaker. And, and, and then when I tell people, most comedians painfully shy, you know, but yet we're, I've done a show for 72,000 people at halftime at a Houston Texans game, but sometimes I can't ride in an elevator with people because I just feel too anxious, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, you know, it gives people 
you know, at least I'm rewriting the narrative when it comes to public speaking. And that's that's something I really like to do because, you know, shit, we'll be living on Mars and people will still be afraid of public speaking. You know, <laughs> we can't have that. Well, how do you show empathy? Like, I mean, you said uh, connect with people on a higher level and be empathetic to them. Like, so if if I'm a speaker and I'm starting out and, and I, I'm listening to your your courses and listening to this podcast, like how do I go into it, go on a stage and show empathy yeah. for uh, 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 maybe a, uh, an audience of like 200 people. I think again, some of it, it happens again, non-verbally. So it's happening to the, to the audience member and it's happening. You're doing it, but it, it's, it's more on, you know, it could, it could be something as simple as you're speaking at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, acknowledging the fact that, Hey, listen, you know, I, we all drew the short, you know, we, we're here at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, nobody's got a ton of energy, you know, do the best that you can, you know, but, but I understand that it's nine o'clock in the morning and, you know, I just happen to be speaking now, but you know, whoever speaks at one in the afternoon, right after lunch is going to have a much better time than this. Um, but, but, but also not just knowing that on a subconscious level that they don't want to hear information as soon. The first thing out of your mouth should be story. Okay. And that itself is on a, on a subconscious level, your, your metric to them that, you know what, this person does care about me because they're not just jumping into that. They're not trying to sell me right away. They're trying to establish the character. Let me know who they are. They're trying to make a real human connection. So I think that alone is very empathetic because it's, because it's, it's, Human beings, we will understand it, even if we don't understand it on our conscious mind, we'll understand that, wow, that's a very human thing to do instead of just getting up there and thinking about themselves, which is I want to jump into my presentation and get this shit done because I'm uncomfortable up here. But to go, you know what? I'm so comfortable. I'm so confident in my in, in, in what I'm doing up here that I don't have to jump in. I don't have to hide behind the facts and figures. I can actually just be a person. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, even though the, the, the person doesn't register and go, wow, that's very empathetic of them, they will feel it, you know, just on a human on a human level, you know. Um, but then also, I think using humor, knowing that this this that the speaking situation doesn't have to suck, you know, it doesn't have to be boring, you know, that that I have a plan. You know, and, 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 and part of it's going to be to entertain you and use humor. And, and I think that is thinking about them. Just say, listen, I got to be up here for an hour. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's either you're going to sit there like a zombie wanting to reach for your phone or you're going to be engaged. And and, and so I, I think it's it's the, it's a it's a bunch of little things that you do that 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 makes them feel that way. But it's it's almost like I tell people I know I've done it not by how hard they laugh, but how quiet they get. You know, because if you can get 300 people to all shut the hell up at once, you know, you know, you're doing something right. So, you you know, that that's later on when I'm like, I really look for the silences to know how how much I fuse them or how well I'm doing. It, it has nothing to do with the laughs. Um, it, it, it has to do with the silences because, you know, that that just shows me that they're really, you know, engaged, you know, and, and on the level. And then I. I try to make that engagement early and then as long as I reinforce it with eye contact and body language and enthusiasm and humor and story, you know, I, I won't break it. And then so I teach a lot of people the, the, the mistakes that people make over the course of, of their speech um, that breaks the engagement, you know. So so part of it is, you know, working one side of the room more than another side of the room, you know, so I really, you know. Pick a spot a third of the way out, three sections in the room and those are your spots and I, I just beat that into them and then teach them visualization techniques, you know, so that, you know, when I'm preparing for a show, I've won even before I've gotten up there because I'm, I'm just so prepared and I've thought it through so much. And that is very empathetic. The audience goes, they actually care. Whereas most speakers just get up there and go, you know, Jimmy got me this gig. I'm going to take the check. And if you guys learn something, you learn something. Um, or they try to over teach, which is, you know, not not good either. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's just in, in how you do it. Is, there's an empathetic way to do things. And, uh, um, you know, that it, it isn't it isn't one thing like I always tell people, I wish I had a magic wand. I wish I could just go out there and go just say strawberries and they'll fall in love with you. It's not <laughs> that, but it's a process that I can yeah, teach it's a process. In, a, in a bunch of different mediums, whether it's speaking, leadership, sales, you know, uh, trying to, you know, 
be the you know get, get, get win the attention of a of a, of a, of, a, of a partner you know whatever it is you know it's humor is strategy and 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 it's 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 I'm getting the traction I mean I'm writing the narrative and and educating the market but uh you know they're, they're starting to buy in but I also think it's because they're really out of options you know I mean as far as a leader to get your employees to be more productive and innovative you got to come up with something, you know, I mean, until the robots get here and bail them out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody wants, everybody wants like the 10 hacks on how to be funny or, or, or get a, you know, enhance their market, but it's not ever like that. It's always, you have to put the work in. Like you said, it's a process where I think today it's a little bit easier for speakers because they can watch a lot of YouTube and video yeah. themselves and study that. But like you coming up, like you didn't have any of that. Like, how did you, no. How did you get better? Like how I mean besides going out there and and getting it done and going out there and getting the experience, like how did you like get your routine uh to where you wanted it? I mean it's it's actually one of the things I teach people I go it's why public speaking and comedy kind of are challenging more so than music or some some of the other things you may do is because there's really no place to practice it. You can't be on the train going, "Hey, listen, I'd like to try my jokes out on you people," you know? Um because first of all, you're never going to get a a great uh, you know, idea of whether or not the stuff is funny because, you know, I mean even with your friends, you go, "Hey, do you guys think this is funny?" Never ever ever say that. But what I tell teach people is just work the material into regular conversation, you know, and then what, what I do when I'm working on new materials, I'll go sit at the blackjack table for a few hours so that, um, you know, new audience comes in. I tell them the jokes. And then, you know, after, you know, I've tried it out on five different people, at least I have some confidence because you never want the first time you tell a joke to be on stage. Um, and I and I hate going to open mics and I and I don't even feel like that's a good place for me to try it out. So I just slide it into conversation. But I actually do have 10 tips that I give people um, uh, in, in, in the in, and in those 10 tips. It literally is. If you only had that slide and those 10 tips, you would still be a much better public speaker um, than without them, because it, it just, you know, it's not just about. You know, people have a set of fears. So the, so I, as a speaker, I have fear. I have a fear that I'm not going to be able to memorize it. That's a huge fear for people. OK. And there's a good reason for that, because technology has turned us into idiots. So um, we're not using any of the mem memory tracks that we were given, you know, as a species, you know, handwriting. I mean, I have a, a pen in my hand right now because you know what? When you have a pen in your hand, it stimulates that part of the brain that allows you to be creative. But if you sit in front of the computer and try to type, it's not going to work. Um, there's actually a formula. Most people try to write jokes in the paragraph form because most people write in the paragraph form. But the first thing I have to do is change the mindset and rewrite the narrative so that they understand that when you're writing jokes, you're writing dialogue. So it's more like a movie you know, like you would see in a script. Um, so I teach them a joke writing formula. And then, you know, so now I start to give them the tools that they can, they can use. And also the reason your stories work with your friends or maybe don't work with your friends is that they're just too damn long, you know? And so we talk about wasted motions and, and looking at the copy and going, you know, Anything that doesn't need to be here, we need to get out because, you know, it, it's just when I watch people's talks, I'm like, you didn't you didn't need to start there. You could have started the, the story from here. Um, you know, you you told them something there that we could have told them once in the beginning, you know, that you, you know, what, however you built your science. And so when I teach people to build talks, I always say just do it like a three act play um, and, and understand, too, that, um, you know, most sitcoms are written that way and most sitcoms were written at a 12 year old intelligence level, you know? So it's not like, you know, a lot of times the expert winds up being too much of an expert, you know? And then again, there's empathy again. He doesn't care about me because he's only thinking about the people who he thinks are smart enough to get this, but he didn't find a way to massage the material into a way that I can digest it, even though I'm not an expert on, you know, on, on whatever he's talking about. So, you know, it's those kind of things that are like, again, the, 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 bot, the, the, the subconscious will register as, as, as empathetic um, because, you know, if he does it the other way, it's going to be registered, you know, a different way. So, uh, yeah, so I, I you know, I, I, I've broken down the process. Into, all my teachings come from what I call the three rings of stand-up comedy that there basically are three pillars to this. One is the public speaking part of the job, which if you don't understand that part of the job, you'll – You'll die a horrible death. I mean, not only have I been on stage 6,500 times, I've watched, you know, 
20,000 people attempt this, if not more, um, more than that. I can't even imagine how many people I, I, I should come up with that number. Um, but I, I've watched them fail and, and some of them were actually funny. They just didn't know how to do it, you know, and they, they didn't go up there and establish your character and establish your point of view and, and really understand that there's more to being funny than just being funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, I, you know what I like? I like conversation. Like when I listen to, mm -hmm. like, you know, Joe Rogan does a lot of conversation and he talks to a lot of comedians and it's just like free rolling and it's funny. And then Ryan Sickler, who is from Baltimore, he had a podcast um, that isn't, he, he started a new one. It's called the honeydew, but he does like this conversation storytelling podcast. And I feel like that to me, like you were talking about rolling it into a conversation. Like that's the best but way to practice because um, you're testing it out on like, I mean, obviously don't test it out on your friends, but uh, test it out at the workplace. If it's, if it's okay. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about how some workplaces are, are a little, you know, kind of well, the, cold yeah. or whatever, but, um, but the line like, at the grocery store, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, the Uber so, driver, anybody, you know, yeah. try it out. I mean, I mean, try out your, your talks too. If you're, if you're a speaker yeah. and you're doing Absolutely. some, you know, try it out a little bit, not the whole speech obviously, but like, yeah. you know, maybe the opening, try it out on somebody, uh, you know, wherever you're at and see how, how it feels. And, you know, like Kevin Hart was on Joe Rogan and he says, um, you know, it, it takes him like a year to get like a a good show together, like to get yeah. his jokes or because he's out there hustling. I mean, obviously, he does a lot of movies and a lot of other things, but he um, he goes to these clubs and he and he tries them out before he even goes on tour. Like he's he's a year deep in his research on what's going to hit, what's not, what feels good, what doesn't. And, and as a speaker, I, as an entrepreneur, you have to do that, too. Like everybody wants I don't know what it is, Matt. Like everybody wants this instant gratification, this instant yeah. success yeah. like you talked yeah. about. Like they don't want to put it in the work. I mean, you've, you've and these are people that th th think about these people not to cut you off. But these are this is why I got into this business, because they these are all smart, highly intelligent people. But they don't aren't necessarily they weren't the class clown. They weren't the you know, these are these are shy, introverted people by nature. But now they have to be the face of their business. They have to do a podcast. They have to go Facebook live. I mean, geez, I, I have a couple of clients that we rehearse before they go Facebook live because, you know, especially the higher level people because you're right kevin hart if he goes out there he's got too much to lose by bombing is not an option for kevin hart you know so you know he has got to make sure the, the material is proven uh before he takes it out there but um but but as you mentioned you know i tell people when you know oh well uh, you know public speaking itself but having a conversation with the audience that that's really what it breaks down to i mean you know it's, it's you're having a conversation with a thousand people at once but the more conversational it is the 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 the, the, the more engaging it's going to be to the audience for for, for sure for sure mm, in, in that conversation you can't like <laughs> the truth comes out in the conversation. Let me tell you yeah. something. You start getting comfortable and you start getting, Oh man, they, they're really feeling me tonight. You know? And then that's yeah. when the truth, your true self comes out. That's when you can be vulnerable. And that's where the magic happens. Absolutely. And I talk about improv, like as it relates to stand up comedy and, um, it, it's not like, first of all, the improv that you know of like the games where it's like, you know, yell out a occupation and they're like a butcher and, yeah, I need a setting and it's always Starbucks or Walmart. It's a, one of those two. And, you know, and then the, the, the group creates, you know, some some comedy on stage. But when it comes to stand up comedy, it's it, most of the time that thing that we're doing that you think we're doing in front of you, you know, in real time. We've done so much before. I the great thing about all my courses and and uh, is uh, you know when I talk about improvisation, I mean, who's the greatest improvisational? When I say improvisational comedian, who do you think of? Improv, um, he just Robin died. Williams. Robin Williams. So there you go. So when I talk about improv, I talk about Robin Williams. But when I talk about the science of of of, of the improvisation as it pertains to stand up, um, so I worked with Robin Williams five nights in a row at DC. So you know, and, no so way. I got to see the show five nights in a row. Yeah, and um, audience would come up to me because you know he was you know getting. You know, it's it's he was out there. So he uh, you know, was he didn't go out and talk to the people after the show. It just you know, he was too broken to do that. And and in a lot of cases, I don't even like doing that part of it just because I'm I'm just too shy. I'm just too shy to do that, even though I can perform for them. But, you know, I've got 
the science to, 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 to help me through that. But um, people would come up to me and go, oh, my God, this is amazing. He thought of all that stuff. He did the same show, by the, by the way, five nights in a row, the same exact show. But it looked like he was doing it all in front of them, you know, that that he was making all this stuff in front of them. But he was so good at that. And that's really what happens when it comes to stand up is that we do it once that first time, that first time where you just had a conversation with the audience and something magical happened. And then the rest of our lives, we're just spending it trying to recreate that situation to make it seem that organic. But, you know, that first time you do it, oh my gosh, it's, but you never would have gotten there if you didn't get to that level where you were that comfortable, the audience was that comfortable. And it wasn't a speaker audience situation. It was just like, you're controlling the moments. The moments aren't controlling you. It, it's like at, when this happens, I'll leave my body and just hover over it and watch the vehicle do this thing I was born to do. But it it it, it, it just it, it transcends time and space and 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 anyone can do that. It's just you have to get out of your own damn way. Mm. Has there ever been like like a specific time where you like? took a step back and was like all the work that you put into it, like it came together. Like you, you were sitting there and you were like in this, this, this feeling of, I just crushed the sh- I just crushed the shit out of the show. Or maybe you were hitting all on all cylinders in your life. Everything was coming together. Like, have you ever like, what, give me the example of that time. Like yeah, at what sure. point in your life did that happen for you? Like just this, I don't know, man, it just seems like a lot of people, Especially me. Like, we always go through this grinding day in and day out. And there's never really light at the end of the tunnel because it's like, one, you don't know exactly. You know, you have an idea where you're going to go. Like, you have this goal. But sure. You don't, you don't know how to get there. So, it's kind of like you're just you're just grinding day and, day and night and you're doing your research and you're trying to make connections and you're trying to network and you're trying to do this and that and that and that. But when that moment hits, it's so blissful, right? It's just like, oh, my God, this is what I've been working for. Like, what moment yeah. was that for you? Well, I mean, there's, there, it happens a lot. Um, and it's almost like a tree in the forest because, like, you'll have this show where you go, there are 10 people of the history of comedy that could have done a show that good. You know I mean? That's like – in my greatest of shows, I'll put them up against anyone. And I've been on stage with Chris Rock and, and everyone else. And, you know, I never – it was never about Hollywood for me and it was never about being famous for me. It was about this craft and mastering this. Um, however, this is why I watch them when they come into the room. And, and, and I think about – a lot of times I have to like undo the damage that has been done to them before I can do what I want to do with them. So, you know, them waiting in a long line because the box office couldn't get their shit together or there was a ton of traffic getting into the club because Obama was giving a speech across the street. Back when I used to do D.C., Obama would screw me all the time. Like he'd give these – It was the, the Mayflower Hotel was right across the street from the improv. So he would give speeches over there all the damn time. They would close the street and people would have to park blocks over and walk in. And then they're sitting in front of you make me laugh. So there are some times where you, you're in front of an audience and you go, oh, shit, I don't have to do any of that. Like they rolled over. These, these people are ready. And then I go, okay, now I can get to what you're talking about quicker. And then and then I have, like, again, the jokes I have to do to get the jokes I want to do. Um, but then even once I make the transition, so it start off with the easy stuff, then you do the smart stuff, then you do the dirty stuff. Because if you open up with the dirty stuff, that's all they're going to want. You open up with the smart stuff, you're going to alienate some of the crowd because – they might have been able to get those jokes if you would have done them later in the set once you've established your character and sold them on some other material. Like I, some of my punch, my jokes have like 12, 13 punchlines. Like I'm doing long form stand up where, so I have a joke where I talk about, you know, uh, I was at Walmart and, uh, you know, again, we know what shops at Walmart and the type of people at Walmart. And there was a guy parked next to me and he had a dream catcher hanging from his rear view mirror. But then I looked over and he had like a piece of shit car, a mean wife, this thick friggin' kid. And I'm like, dude, I think your dream catch is broke. <laughs> I'm like, why don't you turn it around? Your dreams appear to be escaping. <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, uh, you got a nightmare catcher. Yeah, you probably you, you bought that at Walmart. Yes, you did. Yeah, it was made by Indians, but not that kind. And <laughs> where it's like an audience where they, they laugh at like the seventh punchline. And I'm like, oh, my God, this like – and then there's some jokes that we love and they're kind of metric jokes where we're like barometer jokes where we like if they laugh at that, then, oh, my God, they're going to love this part of the set. And so, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it happens a lot of times, but I think when I did my show here in Vegas, um, we have a media night. It's a big media night show. And and I've been lucky. It, it was It's funny because, like, I've had specials and I've had times where – Comedy Central was in the room and I beat the shit out of the audience. And after it was over, Comedy Central didn't say anything to me. Like, you know, because, again, they're looking for a younger version of me. You know, mm-hmm. they, they have different things that they're going after. But so those were great shows. But the times where the magical show happened was I did my media night here in Vegas. And that and that was everything. Everything was on the line. And I think, you know, I, I made sure I brought my best because – that that's a hundred reviewers in there. Um, you know, if they say this isn't a good show, you got no friggin' chance whatsoever. So you know, you know, everybody's in in the audience, and it was one of those things where it, it just it just worked. I mean, they just it just even though they were media people, they they bought into every concept that I that I went with. They they because the good thing about my show is is it's not just my story it's our story and it's i'm really intentional with that you know i mean how much the world has changed i mean it may be easier now but it it may have been better before when we used to be able to go outside and play and you know go down the street and knock on somebody's door and you know not have to send them a text and you know you know you know it, it so this whole audience did that and then and then when it's going well like I, I'm like a chess player where I can see 10 moves ahead because I don't have to worry about the thing I'm doing right now because they're already into it. And and so, you know, it, it's happened a bunch of times. I mean, I, I'd say, you know, because I don't leave it up to chance and I do the same thing every single time, you know, it's like it's like golfers talk about that. They go through their routine, you know. I go through my routine. It starts about three hours before the show. Um, I do my research ahead of time. Once I get to the club, I watch them come in. I, I know what I have to do. I – I do the things in the beginning, but some nights they just roll over and it's beautiful and, and, and it's just, it's what you want. But most of the other times it's a job like you're talking about where, Mm -hmm. you know, you just got to fucking, you know, you just got to (laughs) work. Well, you know, you talk about the bad times. Like, was there any certain time in your life where you were kind of like, shit, man, like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, like you just doubted everything you were doing. That, that that part never like I mean I knew I could make people laugh and I knew that the business I mean once I started learning about the business I mean Hunter S Thompson said about Hollywood it's a plastic hallway full of pimps thieves and whores where good men die like dogs there's also there's also a negative side um, so you know once you realize how the sausage is made and what it's going to take to but for me it was always Hollywood was just one stream of revenue was just, you know, one path, you know, that you could go down, but it's certainly not the only path, you know, and I, I would meet comics like that. I would meet Christian comics who could buy and sell the guys you see on TV. You don't know who they are, but this guy opens up for Joel Olstein. you know, he makes $9 million a year. So I, I knew there were other ways. So even though, you know, I, I did last comic standing, I knew last comic standing pretty quickly into the process was fixed and I wasn't going to be able to win, but I was going to be able to use it to my advantage because I was going to get on TV every week for a little while. But I knew that they weren't going to pick me to win because it's like American Idol. They're not leaving it up to the people. You know, I mean, it's uh, so, uh, you know, there, there was times where, I, you know, obviously were disappointed. But at the end of the day, I I knew if you could make somebody laugh and, and do it the way I do it, that's a skill that's going to be valued forever. Um, yeah, but, but that's you when know. you like that's when you learn the business, though. Like, right, what about before you learn the business? Like, I'm talking about like guys oh, right gosh. now. Oh, I'm talking gosh. about like right <laughs> now, like, let's say even even me, for instance, like I'm learning yeah. the business of podcasting. Like, I don't know the business, yeah, but yeah. I'm learning it. But th- there was a definite definitely a time when you were coming up maybe in the early days where it was like you're learning you're getting your feet wet like there had to be times where you're like man i don't know if i'm meant for this oh shit i mean when when we get to corporate gigs so i go i've done 6500 shows i bombed where i remember i bombed where i can still feel it on me right now three times one time was in west virginia and i blame that on west virginia i mean they literally turned <laughs> off the race they turned the race off and then brought me up and out on stage and and I'm on there. But then I'm, you know, after it's over, I mean, like, I, I, I just leave. I like I had a hotel room for the night and it was like a bad storm coming in. But I, I wanted to be as far away from these people as humanly possible. And then I start to go, well, you know what? This is more of America than New York City is. So, you know, I'm if I can't make them laugh here. 
then I'm going to lose half of this country, you know, in terms of an audience base, you know, I mean, you know, so, so, you know, am I going to be able to do so? So, so yeah, I did think about it that time, that time, especially because, uh, uh, you know, I had been performing in DC and Philly and New York and East coast. And then, uh, you know, once you get out there in the rest of the country, you realize, you know, it's a big friggin' place, you know, there's 300 million people, you know, 200 million live somewhere else. And, uh, I better learn how to make those people laugh. And, uh, and then I did, you know, and, and then I did, but, uh, you know, no, now that you mentioned it, uh, that, 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 that's, uh, that, that was definitely a time. Um, and then also just, being out there, I mean, I would go on the road for months at a time in the beginning because I knew it was going to take 10 years to perfect the craft. So it didn't matter if I was in New York. So the easiest place to get a lot of shows in your, under, in your, under your belt is out on the road. So, you know, I mean, so quickly I had to come up with an act that I knew could work in, you know, Columbus, Ohio as well as it was going to work in, in Washington, D.C. and Topeka, Kansas and everywhere else. And that that actually – became one of the greatest skills I, I have now, which is I can do an urban audience in, in Baltimore, or I can do a Southern audience in Alabama, or I can do a, you know, the, 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 the Seattle uh, show, or I can do a corporate show. And then like the show you saw, that's the other thing is that most people go, oh, you know, how funny, first of all, how funny can he possibly be? Because it's a corporate event, you know, I mean, you know, you're, you're pretty shackled when it comes to, to those kind of things. So, you know, I always kind of like let them know that this is a comedy show. It just happens to be the setting has changed. So I became this like, re because I knew that if I wasn't going to, the comedy club is easy. I mean, that's like, you know, they, they, they're all set up for you. But uh, when you just walk into a, you know, just a, a, a banquet room at a at a at a Marriott, you know, you're gonna have to turn that into a comedy club. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I I think I I, I figured out those things, but I I figured I never let it beat me down too much because I, there was no plan B. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a plan B, so I just figured, you know, uh, these were challenges, but I'd have to figure them out. What would your advice be to those that just feel like they continuously fail? that are losing motivation, that are losing hope, what would you say to them? Always to me, self-belief, you know, I go, you know, I go, one of the things with stand up is if you don't believe you're supposed to be up there, nobody else will. So even, even if either you got to lie to yourself or whatever, but, um, you know, I always just said, what, why did I get into this? You know, I mean, I got into this because I wanted to make people laugh. And, and then, so let me focus on, yes, I could sit here and focus on the negative shit, but, but if I just focus on being funny, you know, so many times, I mean, that was some of the best advice I ever got from a guy named Pat Cooper early, early on. He, and, 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 and it's funny, you do these podcasts and then now you realize, you know, it was good advice on a bunch of different levels, but one of them was, he goes, that's the only thing you can control. If you sit here f worrying about the business, you know, like if I would have just like Hollywood is what Hollywood is. If I wanted to be part of Hollywood, I, I could have made it easier on myself and easier on Hollywood, you know, to to be able to, to bring me into the fold, you know, um, you know, become a writer, you know, you know, find out what problems they have and how I can solve them. But if I just sat there and focused on, you know, that it's a shitty, horrible place, you know, where guys like, you know, um, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein are rewarded for so many years, you know, I mean, it's not, it's a toxic, horrible place, but if I focus on the negative things, then only negative things can happen. So I always just focused on being funny, you know, and, and fixing that. And if I can make them laugh, I will always have a job, you know? And so whatever the thing is that you're doing now, and if it's challenging, don't focus on the things that, 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 that you can't control, focus on what you can control. And, and then, like I said, you control the moments. They're not controlling you. That, that gives you power, gives you a, a tremendous source of power. So I started booking shows outside of the system, you know, producing my own shows and realizing that, you know, then the internet came around and then leveled the playing field. And you know what, just because it sucks today doesn't mean it's going to suck tomorrow. That that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. How can, how can people connect with you, Matt? Um, they can, uh, a lot of different places. I'm on LinkedIn, Matt Kazam on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I just launched, um, the online platform where all of my courses are out there called the strategic humor institute uh yeah nice short uh 
<laughs> uh, domain there, but strategichumorinstitute.com or theylaughyouwin.com for my corporate training programs and coaching programs on there. Um, but I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm not on Instagram because I'm not a 14 year old girl, but it, it enrages. It enrages <laughs> people that I'm not on Instagram, but I, I can't even figure. I wanted to post something there last night, and I don't even have the app on my phone. So um, I'm on all the social media stuff, but uh, um, they laugh you win or strategichumorinstitute.com, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and and I'm still out there doing stand up. You know, not 400 shows a year anymore, but uh, I still I still love doing it. So uh, you know, they could always look for me at a comedy club or theater or casino near you. That's funny. You were busting my balls about Skype earlier, and you're not you're not even on Instagram. I don't even know how to use Instagram. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. Yeah. So I, I have my, to end my shows. I've I've come up with this uh, this question, and it's it's pretty philosophical in, in my mind, anyway. So when 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 you ask the question, "What is my meaning to life?" What are the yeah. first thoughts that come up? I mean, I've always been kind of. And it's weird because it's like even as a kid, I I realized I was given gifts and blessings. Like I never take any credit for for being funny. You know, I mean, I was born this way and my parents nurtured it and teachers nurtured it and people made me who I am today. And I'm always I always felt like I it's parts of my life. I was doing less with more talent. And so I've kind of always been, you know, trying to 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 live up to well why do i have this you know and which is now i realize that i didn't know the world was going to become the way the world is but i feel like i was given this and my real talent is my ability to teach comedy it really is i mean i take um a group of entrepreneurs now every two months uh six to seven entrepreneurs put them through my program uh and they perform 15 minutes of comedy on broadway you know it's called this uh, entrepreneur ceo stand-up challenge um and it's life changing. I mean, it literally is like taking somebody up Mount Everest. I mean, you know, they it's such a powerful growth program. And and most people would rather climb Mount Everest than do this. So, you know, I, I feel like if you know why you're here and you, you, you know what your what your place is in the world. And and then if everyone knew that, then I mean, that's why villages are so much happier, you know, in the middle of nowhere, because everybody knows their role, you know, and and everyone was given different blessings. And, you know, the ones that could run fast became the hunters and, you know, this. So and and and, I, and, and for me, it's not about anything man made, you know, I mean, I think. A cell phone is just a tool. I never, I don't look for joy where joy doesn't exist, you know, and I think that's a big problem with society. And, you know, at the end of the day, comedians were just social philosophers, you know, uh, and, and, and I was studying people and then holding the mirror up to them. So, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's about, you know, the human experience and, and connecting with as many people as you possibly can. And it breaks my heart because I, I teach my daughter this too, is, if I'm walking down the street and someone else is walking down the street towards me, I'm going to say hello to you, even though you're going to look at me like I'm an asshole. Nine times out of ten, they're going to look at me like I'm an asshole because – but a dog will do it. You know, A dog will be, hey, I'm a dog. You're a dog. We should just fucking celebrate that we're both dogs. You know, And I will do that even though humanity is changing. So, yes, my meaning of life you know, is, 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 is almost like a thing of the past, but – I figure we, we, we were a certain way for six billion years. And just because Facebook and technology has come out doesn't mean we have changed that much. It just looks like we have. So uh, I don't know if that answers the, the question, but I always felt like, what is my place? You know, not, 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 and I knew it pretty early on because I could make people laugh and I could make people feel better and I could, and I could, and then I could get humor, use humor to get what I wanted. But if I kept that all to myself, you know, that would be so selfish. And, and, you know, and I, and I think, you know, there are certain, there's like a code like Dexter or something, you know, I have, I have a code that I, that I kind of live by and I, I stuck to that, you know, and, uh, uh, it wasn't always easy. And, but at the end of the day, I like who I see in the mirror. So, you know, yeah, that, no, that's a great answer. I think that, uh, you know, Seth Godin talks about that and linchpin where, we need to use our gifts to help the world. But, you know, I was at Cadre Con too, and I asked him that question, and he was like, nah, I don't mean the whole world. I meant, like, your world. like the people, Your world, yeah, yeah. People in your world that you can directly affect. And I think I think your world is just a little bit bigger than most, but you're doing a great job with your gifts. 
I, I'm trying, man. I, I'm trying, but I, I, I could, I couldn't do it without, uh, you know, people like you. You know, I, again, I, I don't have Instagram and I don't have my own podcast, so I, I, I'm always blessed and honored to, to, to be on, on shows like this. Well, Matt, so. thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. Check him out. He is Matt Kazam. Hashtag humor scientist. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. You got it, man. Thanks so much. Be well. I want to say thank you to Matt Kazam for coming on the show and hanging out and having a great conversation about humor and the science behind it. You guys can check him out on all social media. He is now on Instagram, so check him out over there. You guys can check me out on Instagram at tdowns80, on Twitter at Downs Trey, and on Facebook at Trey Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S. If this is your first time listening to the show, please hit subscribe and leave a rating and a review. Everything helps us out as as far as scaling the show and getting this to people who need it and to gain a little bit more motivation in their everyday lives and find that inspiration to help lead them to success. Thank you guys for taking the time to listen to this episode. I, I couldn't do it without you, literally. You guys are awesome. You guys are the best fans out there. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. And I will talk to you guys next week.